multiple time zones. In Auckland, it is 9 a.m. No, it's 9 to 9.45, so that doesn't work. So that's too far south. Yeah. Trying to guess time of where it, exactly it's 6.30 in the morning. I just don't know where that is. It, it sounds like it's got to be somewhere near Japan as far as, as time zone, but probably further towards the Pacific. Yeah, maybe. So we're trying to figure out exactly where the hell it's 6.30 in the morning. So, Michael, you're going to have to tell us. Maybe it's Australia. Maybe it's somewhere in Australia. That's probably where it is. Yeah, there it is. Australia. Adelaide, Australia. Okay. Hello, everybody. As you can see, we are without Veronica. So, you know, there's probably to be a, an exponential increase in fart jokes. Sausage fast! What are oh, you doing? Oh, 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 oh. Or kitty fest. <laughs> you know, for a minute there, after I said sausage fest, I thought you were going to give us a crotch shot. <laughs> no. I'm going to show the kitty that's busy trying to chew my foot off. What do you mean trying? Give me that back. That's mine. Mine. Kitty, give me, give me. Give me, give me. Give me. <laughs> mine. Hi, Brett. You're tr making trouble. I see how that works. Veronica makes more fart jokes, jokes than we do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Terry is apparently in show and cat mood. Or show and pet. Show and pet. I'm trying to calm the, the savage beast. I don't think you can calm the savage beast by rubbing the belly. Doesn't it just make the beast more savage at some point? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. No, we're not here to do cat chat. We have other things to do, so I guess we better get to it. Howdy, folks, and welcome to another episode of the Dev Robot Society. I am Paul E. Cooley. Joining me is Mr. Terry. Pick up the pace, Mixon. Mr. Hi Mixon, how are you, sir? I'm actually pretty good. I can't complain. Well, that was a quick uh, uh, small talk. <laughs> Savage Floof will not be placated. What have you been up to? I was writing. I had a little bit of a, a hiccup yesterday that made it a non-writing day, but I'm five chapters away from wrapping up book 14 in the Last Hunter series. Yay! I'll still have to read it, but, you know, it's done. I should have it done before the uh, eclipse. Are you going to see the eclipse, or are you just going to ignore it? I'm going to ignore it. Ah, see how you are. The very first, you know, the, the last time you'll be able to see a, a total eclipse in a couple of decades, and you're just going to go, meh. After Bonnie Tyler's total eclipse of the heart, I'm done with total eclipses. But um bum No? Mm. No? I'm more like, my Maserati does 185. That, where's eclipse in that? I don't know. Oh, my God. <laughs> Rick, Rick, Rick posted, Life's Been Good to Me So Far, so that immediately got my brain going on that other song. Oh, I see. All right. So basically, you're an ADHD cat or just a mm -hmm. cat. Got it. Pretty much. Well, I didn't start this. This was Rick. Get my toe. Mine. Give me get back. Well, I'm glad we have stuff. We can say stuff that's not on the bingo card. Ow! That's my toe. That's my finger. Well, uh, uh, okay, so uh, uh, you have nothing else to say other than you're being attacked by a cat. <laughs> She's going downstairs now. Oh, damn. Got kicked out of daddy's room. That's bad news. Weird and exotic plants. Well, I had a good week, so to speak. Uh, we had some medical scares go on, but uh, those things are have been assuaged. Well, I'm glad oh. your genitalia did not actually fall off. My oh, wait, we're live. I'm not supposed off. to say that, am I? Sorry, my, my bad. My genitalia did not fall off. They were not in any threat of falling off. There was just they, stuff going on. With they them. were not in any threat? I believe your genitalia may be different than ours. If it's a two they, balls and a cock. that's a that's a they. That, that's genitalia a is a singular that includes all. 
It's not a they. You don't have two genitalia. You have one genitalia. Dude, don't don't make fun of my penis thumbs. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, so, uh, all right. Now that we're done with that, uh, what have I been doing? I've been working on evolution, and now I'm working on Oceania, cleaning it up and finding plot holes, which is amazing to me how this book went through beta readers, went through ARCs, and was even fucking broadcast on Patreon, and nobody caught the holes. Nobody caught the plot holes. I don't know how that's possible. I saw one that uh, was talking about a plot hole that happened in one of the Terminator movies where uh, oh God. an orderly in the hospital gets picked up and hurled against the wall and the orderly that gets picked up and thrown is black and the one that hits the wall is white. He was thrown so hard that it changed his ethnicity. <laughs> Awkward. Penis thumbs was on the bingo car. <laughs> Uh, Paul is finding plot holes the size of his genitalia. So small. I thought you said we weren't going to discuss that live. <laughs> First you're telling everybody my genitalia is falling off, now you're telling them it's small. Well, apparently it's not that much of a problem since it's so small. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should actually go ahead and get to the topic of the show he didn't hear any of that. Maybe we should go ahead and get to the topic of the show so we can avoid more penis and fart jokes. I think that's probably a great idea. <laughs> but, you know, just to be sure, she's going to clear that up for us. Okay, I still maintain penis thumbs count. All right, now that we're done with penis thumbs. It's kind of fun to say, isn't it? Penis thumbs, penis thumbs, penis thumbs. <laughs> Head where penis heads. That's, All right. Uh, that's basically how the Fonz procreated, so why not? Whoa, that's so good. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. So plot holes have been a problem this week, but I'm fixing them before publication, so that would be a plus. Because <laughs> I guarantee you there are people out there who would find it and go, hey, uh, Mr. Cooley, you really fucked up. So anyway, what we're here to talk about today yeah, this is what happens when you're out here, V. You are a calming influence on us, believe it or not. A cult, you're a civilizing influence upon us. Edward's Penis Hands is a real film. I rented it in the 90s. Isn't that a por porno? Just it asking. is. It is, in okay. fact, a porno. All right. Just checking. <laughs> wow, we have really got into the gutter of this show. <laughs> and here we are, eight minutes in, and we're down at the bottom of the gutter. How the fuck did we get here? Um, I'm pretty sure it was you talking about your genitalia. I, you started talking about my genitalia. No, I didn't bring it up. You did. Yes, you did. No, sir. Okay, maybe I did. Maybe I did bring it up. Totally I'll take it. Did. I'll take that. You All totally right. did. Pornos are real films. Yes, I wasn't disagreeing with that. I was simply asking if it was a porno. That's it. I wasn't well, suggesting. That, it was now you've got reason. something to rent for the weekend. You're good. You have to rent it. It's probably on YouTube somewhere. Probably, <laughs> it's it's hiding somewhere safe from their their uh, their sensory stuff. Oh God, that's just too terrifying for words. I asked about topics last night, and I got this 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 three word suggestion, which was Veronica, because a whole new image of fingering the. She's in the audience proof. now. She is not. She is now going to not just be part of the problem. She is going to be the entirety of the problem. <clears throat> the three words I was given were plot and pacing. Which That's two words. Plot and pacing. That's three words. Mm, I'm pretty sure that the and really doesn't count. You're so contrary. I bet you shit sideways. <laughs> Dear God. Why do I even have conversations with you? It's whole, all of this. Anyway, uh, that means something was on your brain. What was on your brain? 
Well, Veronica had made a commentary about, she listened to um, The Last Hunter, and she complimented the pacing on it and how the, how the story was put together. And I thought talking about pacing would be good. And I threw plot in there because, well, plot holes. That's also come up in a different conversation. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about both of them. And we were talking just before the show started about taking something that's plot-wise from real world and making it into fiction. And I think that would fit in as well. So that would be the that would be the question. <laughs> I spat out my coffee. Okay, V. We 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 did Michael, did you proud? <laughs> Beams. <laughs> You know, she's going to come back from this bowling tournament and she is just going to be the instigator in chief and bring this show down low in a way that has never been seen before just to show us that she can do it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wi-Fi is just good enough to listen and heckle. Brett says plotting and pacing do seem quite different. Fast pacing with no plot is just a clone commercial. That's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. The two are similar, but they are different. And I think it's good talking about both of them at the same time. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, we have a plot. We the were plot talking... are the events that you want to happen. Mm -hmm. Those are like the milestone markers if you're driving down the highway of, oh, I hit my marker 18. I, I have now can check mark that off on my character's journey. Okay. That's what, what is... pacing is how you get there. A story is not good if it's all fast. Like uh, using a movie, for example, Gravity. That movie starts off at a dead sprint and never slows down until the end, which I think is a terrible mistake. I think it really costs that movie some in enjoyment factor because you didn't give the audience a chance to breathe. There's, there's a real talent in being able to take and mix in the ability to share what the world is, to do your world building, to do your character development, to go from pieces of, of plot, one plot point to the next plot point at different pacing so that the story has its fast moments, has its slower moments where things are happening that aren't quite as earth shattering. And that's what pacing is, is the ability to get there in a way that's satisfactory for the reader. And Brett asks, do you figure out plot first when you start the book or just see what it, where it goes? I'm a discovery writer, so I have virtually no idea where I'm going when I start the book. I may have one or two major plot points that I want to accomplish, but in, in almost every single case, I don't actually get to the ending I originally foresaw. Somewhere about the halfway point, I have diverged so far that I am making it up as I go. <laughs> it's true. And I have a great time doing it. That's, that's one of the things that I enjoy about writing as a discovery writer is that doing all the wacky things that you read in the books where you go, I'm bored, let's change this up. When I'm writing, I go, I'm bored. I start hunting for things to throw in. And right. it, if it's exciting for me, I tend to think it's going to be exciting for the reader. I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. With plots, I usually have a first uh, five or ten scenes in my head, but the ending that I have in mind is variable, how we get there. Sometimes I have an image for what the end looks like. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just have uh, words in my head or a phrase or something that keeps repeating, and that's related to the ending somehow. My brain just does that. I have plotted more carefully before and tried that, and it lasts for about 10 chapters and then I go off script and I let myself go off script. And usually what happens is I'll grab pieces from that outline for other scenes or other subplots, but it's not in the order I first saw it happening because something else happened along the way. And I went, Ooh, I want to chase that for a while and see where that goes. And by that point, your plot line, your, your, the uh, outline that you've made is almost more or less useless as far as a, a roadmap. It has some stops on it that you can grab and move into the new roadmap. You can pick them up and grab them anytime. 
and massage them a little bit and put them where they're supposed to go. But the outline itself, sh I don't think should be religious. I can't see how it could be not and have an enjoyable story. Somebody, yeah, someone out there is going to prove me wrong, but that's how they do it. So this is not meant to be an absolutist statement. I just can't envision it because that's not how I think. Right. I know some outliners are very, very, very platonic or not platonic. Uh, hmm. The platonic outliners. It sounds like a band. <laughs> I know some people are very, very, very attached to their outlines and they'll write without really have heavily done outlines. That's fine. That's not us. One of the problems with not having a good idea of where you're going if you're not a discovery writer is that if you get off into the beaten path, you end up being the story of the hiker that got lost in the woods and is found six years later dead by the stream <laughs> because you'll have wandered off there and your story will just die or it just will go on until you've written a Brandon Sanderson sized novel that just meanders all over God's creation. Um, if you're not a discovery writer, going off script may not be for you. <laughs> You've heard us talk about the swampy metal. You'll get lost there. Yep. It's a bad place. That one. Chris asked, does that mean that I have to go back and add build up for it afterwards like I throw in an asteroid out of nowhere? My secret to writing is that I write from beginning to end. I start at the first word. I end at the last word. And I very seldom have to go back and add buildup because if I'm going to add something in, I've chanced across something that, that my brain goes, ooh, I could do this thing right here. And it's not something that I have to do buildup for. It's something that all the pieces parts were present for, but it hadn't occurred to me beforehand that I could do such a thing. And now that all the parts were on the table, I said, oh, let's take this and rearrange and insert it right here. And I don't have to usually go back and make much modification at all, if any. Michael says, with pacing, what are your thoughts on the scene the sequel method? I think we're both diehard advocates for that me method. I think so, too. Um, uh, Jim Butcher had, um, I've seen some stuff that he's written about scene and sequel that I thought was pretty good. I don't know that I'm organized enough to say that I actually execute scene and sequel. Seriously, the pacing that I get in my head is literally me telling the story. I don't even think about pacing. I don't think about plot points. I just think about the story that I'm telling as I'm telling it. And I've read enough science fiction and I've, I, I think that I'm a decent enough storyteller that I don't have to focus on the mechanics of figuring out what the pacing are. I simply do it because it's, it's in my subconscious as a storyteller. I think the thriller thing and the suspense stuff just comes along from experience and I don't really think about it either. My brain will just sit there and go, hey, wait a minute, we need to add something here. And then mm -hmm. I add it and then I move the fuck on. And That's I don't it, think exactly. about it too heavily. That's exactly it. If my brain says I'm bored, I'm doing something wrong. Usually, I don't usually have to back up, but if I find myself being slow to write, I've learned to trust that feeling and go, okay, I've taken a wrong turn somewhere. And I'll go back half a chapter or a chapter and I'll fix what, I, what I've messed up. But my brain is pretty good about going, I'm bored. Why am I bored? You need to fix it. And then I have to fix it. Purposeful outliners. Was this, yeah. Sorry. You do, Terry. I can break down TLH1 into scene, sequel chunks, sequels, let the reader process and breathe. Yeah. Yes. And I, I definitely believe in that. I don't, there has to be times where you process what's happened. And I not only do it in a novel, I do it between novels. The first part of a second or third or fourth book in a series is undoubtedly processing what happened at the end of the previous book. Right. And I would say that's evolution in a nutshell, because it's tying together characters from three different books. So there's a lot of there's a lot of processing going on in that one. You just can't get away from it. You have to have it sometimes. Brett says with discovery writing, foreshadowing seems tough until you modify. <laughs> one of the secrets I learned when I was writing mysteries under a pen name 
is you make everyone look guilty and then you select who the actual villain is at the end. Basically, you pluck a name out of the hat. Anyone could have been the guilty party. And that worked for me when I was doing that. And I believe that I litter my stories with hooks that I could follow, foreshadowing for events that never actually take place. It's in this book, in, in that book, or maybe not ever. Right. I, I'll put I'll put things in there that could be used and I may not ever utilize that. So I don't know that I have to go back and do much foreshadowing because when I'm making a change, it's usually a spur of the moment thing with the events that are currently in progress by throwing a wild card in that then has to be explained after the fact. And sometimes explaining it after the fact is more fun than, than foreshadowing. But then it's not foreshadowing, it just becomes misdirection. Mm. Mm, I can sort of see that. With a mystery, misdirection is very important. Right. More so than foreshadowing. Yeah. So I, I agree with what you're saying, Brett. I just... I never have to go back and foreshadow something that I'm doing. You can interpret that how you like. Uh, maybe I subconsciously <laughs> foreshadow. Maybe I don't foreshadow at all. I have no idea. You tell me. I think that comes again with with experience. And you don't really think about it too much because all you're writing, <laughs> it's, it's like he said, you're leaving hooks for yourself and some of those hooks you chase. Uh when you plop down those hooks, part of you is already thinking about how would I use that in the future? There was a hook, two hooks I placed in the first damn book of Derelict Saga, and I didn't know I was going to use them until I was writing the last 30,000 words of Trident. That's when I found out I needed those two hooks. So were they foreshadowed? Yes. Did I purposefully foreshadow them? No. Because I had no idea I was going to do that or that I was going to use those. It's just my brain plopped down those little pieces. And then I basically went, okay, that explains this. That explains this. We're ready to rock and roll. When I was writing the last Hunter series, it started off with an invasion by robotic enemy warships. And they didn't really know a lot about who they were, where they come from, what they wanted. And <clears throat> as the storylines progressed... I added aliens and then even more aliens and then humans that came from elsewhere all into this. And I don't know that I foreshadowed any of that as I was going. It was all a convenient surprise to pull on someone at the right moment and then them scrambling to figure out what it meant after the fact. Accidental foreshadowing, does this count? Sure, Sounds why not? Sounds more like serendipity. Here's the question. Does it matter how we're doing it, or does it matter more how the reader interprets it? I believe that it's important for each person to do what works best for them for their writing process. If you need to actively foreshadow something, then do so. If you find that trying to actively foreshadow doesn't work for you, then don't. There are times, there are some books where, yeah, if you write them, you have to go back and say, okay, I didn't explain where this came from. I have to go back and put something in there for it. I've had that happen too. It's just more often than not, I've left a hook that my brain knows it's going to use or can use. I want to focus on the second part of what Brett said. That sounds more like serendipity. I cannot begin to tell you how many times I have taken advantage of the serendipity of me saying something in a previous book or doing something that I could then latch on to four books later and use it as the anchor to do something. I have done that so many times that it is not even funny. Yeah, those are eureka moments and you're just kind of like, holy shit, I am so ingenious. I can't believe my former self saw this coming and did something about it. I, I'm smart enough to realize that my, my former self was not any smarter than I am right now. And so I don't count that as me being smart. I don't count it as me intentionally doing a damn thing. It's me <laughs> looking back and going, I can manipulate this one thing I did and turn it to my advantage now. And I do so. Do you ever place hooks and then edit them out later? Typically yes. not. Typically not. I just leave the hooks there. Because... There have been times in the Empire of Bones series where I've come back, I can think of at least one that I went back 
five or six books to pull that hook out and use it. And if I'd edited it out, I wouldn't have been able to do so. There's some I edit out because I figured out that we're not going to do that in the next series or the series after that or the series after that. This is just not going to happen or was just something that didn't go anywhere. The current series that I'm writing, I'm, I'm, I've got two books left in this series. I dropped a plot hook a couple of books back about a bunch of encrypted messages. They have not yet finished cracking those messages and they may not before the end comes. I may end up using it. I may not end up using it. If I don't end up using it, then it's a wasted plot hook and it'll just be sitting there. Yeah. And when, you're, when you're publishing the books as you write them, it becomes very difficult to edit those plot hooks out. Yeah, that's another thing when you're writing a serial. It's just like, I've let that plot hook, uh, it's just going to have to stay there because <laughs> we had the book and never Once it. it's in print, you've got to live with the canon that you have now established. And sometimes that can prove challenging. And I find that kind of thing actually invigorating to figure out how can I manipulate what has already occurred to allow me to do this one thing that I really want to do right now. Coming, going through evolution was, was kind of like that because I had to put together and use plot hooks from the first three books and kind of wrap them up into this one. And there was some foreshadowing there. But now I'm stuck. Evolution has, has, has the baggage of the canon from the first three books. And book five has the baggage from the first four books. Just damn rice it and change the rules of vampires for each book in a series. <laughs> <laughs> whatever works her her reader stood still for it so why not see the limit here is it's not what we as writers can accept it's what our readers can accept if we're changing the rules as we go along but the readers are buying in and going along with it then it's a win it's also a little bit different depending on what you're writing with hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy douglas adams never nailed down physics it was just this malleable mess once you got used to it being a malleable mess, then it became a great source of humor of, okay, how is it going to be fucked up this time? And it just became a linchpin of the story. I like that about his books. So if you're going to have that kind of plot line where that needs to be malleable, you need to make it malleable up front as much as possible. Are you advocating for Paul Terry V co-authored space vampire thriller romance? <laughs> it's got to have sports in that. It's got to be. It's got to be a space vampire sports thriller romance. Who plays hockey? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that was the joke. Adams ignored everything to make it all pointless. Yeah, it was a big part of it. <laughs> but changing the rules for every book—that's just not not good. Let's drag ourselves back to pacing. We've talked about plot a lot. What advice would you have, Paul, for people that may not feel as intuitively bound to pacing as we might after all this experience? What advice do you have for somebody to manipulate their pacing in a way that's going to be satisfactory? If you've got a, a lot of uh, meetings, you're unfortunately going to have to have some characters talk about some of that stuff. There's ways to do it to where it bores the ever loving shit out of everybody, including you as the author. And there are ways to make it kind of fun. And there are ways to basically parcel out that information, which is to have everybody in the same briefing and then have them talk about another briefing or get together and share thoughts. You have a chance to actually process things. You have a chance to add some conflict. You've got a chance to basically add more stuff for the reader to consider. That would be a sequel to the scene. A better sequel to the scene would be, we had a gunfight, now we need to talk about what the ramifications are of the gunfight. That would be a scene and sequel. For pacing, uh, with me, it's a matter of, I constantly use the, you know, the arcs. I'm constantly building up these parabolas of, of a uh, plot trajectory, and hopefully every one of them has a higher bump higher trough than the last one. So we keep building up to where the book just ends, where we have that denouement drop off. So the pacing is, if I have two chapters or three chapters 
all together that don't do anything and there's no action, there's something wrong. Uh, typically, I've done something where the, 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 I've left out conflict. And that action could just be people uh, talking or uh, having some kind of conflict or argument, even with themselves, about what they're going to do. But there needs to be action, and there's somehow of some variety. As long as people are moving, you have a pace. I think that the way I do this, if I had to put words to it, is things will start off with maybe a relatively small issue at the beginning that the characters are dealing with. And it will rise up towards them having some type of, of problem or, or situation that has to be dealt with. Might not be a fight, might be something different. Somebody wants to relieve you of command and you've got to figure out your way around that. And when they're done with hitting that spike, then it'll come back down as they process everything that happened there. And then the next problem comes along and it goes maybe a little bit more upward. And so my stories are, in a way, they're like yours, but I don't know that they all have to build, in space opera, build higher every single time. The way that mine tend to go is, I think that I usually have a big spike about the middle of the book, and then it falls back away, and there'll be another big spike toward the end of the book. Mm -hmm. I'm always building to a big, big boom at the end. You're You're writing more of a more of a space horror thriller suspense thing. So that makes more sense. The pacing between that and regular space oh, yeah. opera is different. Big, big time, big, 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 big time. Usually in space opera, at least the ones I've read, you have a lot of characters, a lot of shit going on in a lot of different places. And when you talk, start talking about that grand of a scope, you potentially are going to have some interesting pacing, but you have that built in just by switching characters or places. Mm -hmm. When I start the new series, I already know that the initial scene is going to be the main character breaking into a museum to steal something. And I've got ideas how to make that fun and interesting, but then somebody's going to be chasing him because they want that thing that he has. And he needs to get to wherever that thing leads before somebody can get there first and take it away from him. That kind of nonsense. And then from there, the rest of the stuff is going to blow up in their faces. And that's going to cause even more trouble. That's kind of how I like doing things. Give them an immediate problem that has to be dealt with. Let them deal with the, the fallout from that problem and see what the fallout generates as far as the next problem. As a discovery writer, that's critical to me is seeing what makes the best sense for coming with what goes before. With Derelict Saga, if I needed to convey more information I had in the previous chapter about something, I'll probably switch characters and have that character somehow have been involved in the earlier stuff or putting together rumors or whatever else. It basically, just doing that character switch will improve your pacing because mm -hmm. you've, you've dragged the readers into a new spot. And that means you're starting a new scene and Basically, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get that, that rhythm between the scene and the sequel, you're trying to give them equal space and trying to find the, the right balance. And sometimes the sequels are a lot shorter than the scenes, but they still need to be there. Having multiple different point of view characters also gives you the advantage of one particular crisis might be rising where the other one is falling. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Michael says, Terry, you got to write a lit RPG or I'm coming to America. Well, you know, in uh, Kindle Villa, I wrote about 70% of a novel that was lit RPG before I stopped writing it. So I, I did technically start. Technically. Technically. I could pull that down and maybe write, a, write the rest of it, but who has time for that? <laughs> Not the kept man. I know that much. Not the kept man. Now, you're talking plot issues over long periods of time. Uh, one of David Weber's series, the Safehold series, in the very first book of it, he levies a plot hook with the main character, who is basically a consciousness living in a mechanical device. That mechanical device is something that was meant to be operational for a week i.e. you upload your consciousness to this thing, you send it to a hostile environment, you have fun for a week, and you download the memories, 
because at a week it purges and it's done. It's made so that it cannot be used long term because that's not its purpose. And because of the situation that they found themselves in, somebody had to hack that device and make it so that it did not erase everything after a week because they needed it to be operational very long term. The problem with doing that is somehow in the doing it, they disabled the high speed data transfer that that device used. And you just knew that that was going to be important somewhere down the line. That was going to be a hook that had to be used. Unfortunately, he wrapped up the series in a bit of a rush. I think it's about the same time he had a health scare. And I think that he just needed to, he wanted to bring everything to a conclusion point. So that kind of got set aside and that plot hook never got used. I thought it would be interesting to mention that. So that's a, there's a big one sitting out there in that particular series. Huh. That seems like kind of important one you want to mess with. You could see because the key was that having that thing in there meant that the high speed data transfer wasn't available. So in somewhere at the conclusion of the story, undoubtedly the survival of the human race would be predicated on re-enabling that high speed data transfer, which would then start the one week clock ticking to the death of that character. Uh... You could, you could just see that's where it was going, but it never happened that way. Hmm. Interesting. Oops. Up. Oh, no. There goes the neighborhood. There goes the neighborhood. J.R. Handley's here. Let's cut the show short. We've been here 36 minutes. I know. No, no, no. We got, we got, to, be, we got to be live for another 15. Uh, 25. 25. Oh, shit. 25, right. we my should friend. End it now. We should end it now. You can, you can, you're going to have us deal with him for 25 minutes? Come on, man. Uh, it should only take 25 you know, seconds. He'll say something in name, we smack it down, and then he goes He's, away he's jumped in here with the Gerdar loin, so he's dragging us back to genitalia again. Multiple genitalia. Mm. He missed penis thumbs. He just started to elicit a two-time speed and catch up. <laughs> he's not going to miss penis thumbs. Two spike pacing. I'd say that's short story land. Me personally. I, I, the thing is, I've read so many stories over the years that my subconscious really does know if things are getting too slow, if there needs to be something added in. And I can't tell you, I can't tell you at this point how I consciously do it because I don't think I do. Scene, action, conflict, sequel. What just happened and how do we move forward? Yeah, I do that a lot. V says a question. What about things that the author doesn't see as plot hooks, but collaborator, collaborators manage to use? <laughs> I think that's I think that's completely valid. You're writing that, and then some collaborator goes, "Oh, look at what I can do with this thing." So I have this idea about that thing you didn't do. That cup that's sitting on the table. Yeah, what's in that cup? I got an idea. What's in that cup? Let me go. Let me do that. Writing sequels is as as fanfic. Plot hooks are wonderful because they allow us to go back in. If we, we need to find a way back into that universe, we've left a hook. We left a story unsolved. We left a mystery unsolved. We left something like that, which would allow us to basically come back. We've let a character wander off and we've no longer came back to them. So what are they doing? Yeah, what are they up to? What's their life like? Brett says V is talking about the Star Wars series, obviously. <laughs> I can't imagine how anyone thought anything differently. It obviously had to be the Star Wars series she was talking about. <laughs> well, you got when you have a universe of five, five or six hundred books, there's no telling how many Star Wars books there are at this point. Yes, but none of them are canon anymore. What? There's a canon? There what did used that to be. happen? There used to be until they went ahead and went, Nyank. nope, none of this is canon. Everything Jar Jar Binks 24-7 now. Yeah, thank you, Lucas, you shitbag. That wasn't um, Lucas that did that. It was Disney that did that. It was Disney that did that. I mean, good fanfic is basically using the loopholes. Yeah. I can buy that. I can buy that, too. I can buy that, too. 
That's why we have the dominatrix Hermione stories. I have no idea if there actually are any, but it wouldn't shock me. Oh, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. So he's probably got uh, Ron in the gimp suit. Oh my gosh, works. there's a visual I don't think I'll get out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> or filling loopholes like Edward Penis Hands did. <sighs> Going back you know, to the they have these stories about taking actors and, you know, transposing them with their characters. Like they took uh, Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner and took them up to actually be on the Enterprise. Why can't they go ahead and take, you know, the porn actors from the porn parody of Star Trek and put them on the Enterprise? I don't know. That's a very good question. A better question is, why the fuck would you? Because of the face that Spock would make? I'm pretty sure that would be amazing. The Spock that played him in the porno or the actual Spock? Nurse Chapel, what are you doing? <laughs> have you seen Spock's B? <laughs> Wait a minute, I should not have said that. Going where no man has gone before. Uh, yeah, on that note, we have completely devolved again. Again. Because we're really good at it. You know, one of the things we talked about before the beginning of the show, of the, as V says, the Harry Draco slash fic. Yeah, who could forget that? I could. I did. And now I know it exists again. Thank you for that. We were talking about Shogun before the show started. Mm -hmm. And how it would be interesting to take the events of Shogun and put it into like a space opera. How that could easily transpose into a different story and how a lot of writers do take actual historical events and locations and then move them into a wider audience in the far future. And Shogun would be great, but I asked you what historical location and time and events would you take into the future and to make a, a, a new story? I got two of them, French Revolution and the First Crusade. French Resolu Revolution was kind of done in David Weber's Honor Harrington series, which I thought was pretty good. They they even had a Robespierre. So, you know, that's that's a pretty pretty in your face. Go ahead and see. <laughs> I I re still really want to mess with that with Garaga. I really do. Crusaders of Garaga has been on my mind for like 15 years now. Um that would be one that I would put up there, but that's also been done. I'm sure mm -hmm. it's been done over and over and over again. In fact, I would say Warhammer is a continuous crusade. But the uh, it would be interesting to plumb those depths, so to speak, to set up the villains and everything else. And there are ever all, all there are villains in that particular story, as I would tell it. I think if I had to pick one, I would pick the conflict between England and Spain in trying to conquer the New World. Their exploration and their, their fighting against one another, and then throw in the French as well, because they were involved as well. And a good central location around that could be the, uh, the islands where the pirates were there, Port Royal, Tortuga, places like that. I Barbary think that would Coast. be Barbary Coast. Those could be some interesting stories told from the view of, of pirates and, and ne'er-do-wells that have letters of mark and are busy doing their nonsense. I think that would be a great story to transfer over to a, a space opera setting. I would love to figure out how to move the terror into a space opera, but it really wouldn't quite work. The terror? I don't know mm -hmm. that I know this. I think I've talked about it before. There were two ships, the Terror and the Erebus, uh, who were on the John Franklin expedition and they got they were lost they went to go find the northwest passage and were never seen again and both wrecks have been discovered now in the 2000s uh they found both wrecks but there were no survivors no known survivors at all there were signs of cannibalism at one of their camps there's all sorts of crazy but there's no definitive timeline or knowledge about what happened so it's it's very very interesting in that in that sense the terror is event horizon <laughs> um or alien yeah it's possible too 
basically the whole story is the people who are stranded on the boat and what happens to them and they can encounter a creature that should not exist but exists there the book is very different from the series although both of them are great it's just that the characters are better in the series but the story is better in the book um but i would love to kind of capture that feeling of being a you know uh marooned so to speak robinson caruso it's not quite robinson caruso because they haven't left the real world and it's not one person and the survival is a little bit different because i don't remember anything chasing down robinson caruso but i could be wrong about that i just don't remember anything about that veronica says i want to do something with the cold war and proxy war conflicts between two superpowers that could yeah. be good and i would argue that's the expanse before they discover the uh um the first real uh alien artifact you know you may be right that was totally cold war it was totally cold war between mars and earth and using the belters as the plaything, as the pawn what they want to do so i'd look at that that would be a good one though i've been thinking a lot about the cold war i've been thinking a lot about that lately thinking fondly about the cold war Nah, in some cases, yes. <laughs> in some cases, I miss the 80s. In others, I can't get far enough away from it. I think our conflict with the uh, Soviet Union back in the 80s is perhaps, you know, better than the conflict we're having with Russia via proxies right now. No comment. No comment. Robinson Crusoe had to deal with cannibals, captives, and mutineers. Okay. I haven't read the book. So I have no idea. I, don't I read it. I read it years ago when I was in school, and I've I've actually read it again since then. And it's there's a lot more to it than you might think. Hmm. I just remember the Dick Van Dyke ripoff or whatever it was called. Mm. The book. Read the book. Don't don't go by what they did with the movie. No. It's a great documentary about it on Netflix. Uh, which Robinson Crusoe or the Cold War, or The Expanse. Probably now. the Cold War, since she was talking about the Cold War, but who knows? I would think so. I would think so. Regardless, that is the, that that history is a big time deal. Um, the uh, uh, where Charles the First was beheaded with the with the Cromwell War. That's another good one to go after. Uh, yeah, there is there was a lot of there. things going on there. So there's all sorts of, of, of historical stuff that you can grab and definitely take up there. And whether it's ancient history or whether it's you know modern history, you're just picking up and running with. There's a, um, there's a lot of opportunities there if you're stuck for a story idea. Or if you have a good character and you don't know what to throw them in, you know this would be a, a place to put that up there. And it doesn't have to be dystopian, so to speak. It can be, this is just kind of a regular world with some odd habits as opposed to being dystopian. Maybe what the people are trying to do is keep it from being dystopian. You have a lot of options. And just because it's based on the, the French and Indian War, so to speak, or whatever they call it now, just because you base it on that doesn't mean it has to turn out the same way. It's true. You're basically taking historical events and using them as a starting point and then going where you want them to go. Right. Right. And it might help you set up the playing pieces. And whether you're dealing with a pawn or somebody who's at the top, you have the opportunity to kind of use the foils of all of that different stuff. What'd be really interesting is reading, you know, a book on the Crusades taught by a, a, uh, um, uh, a Christian historian versus an Islamic historian, because you get to see both sides of what was going on. There's a great book called Through Arab Eyes, which, which covers the crusade from the, from the Muslim perspective. And it's, it doesn't have to change your mind about anything. It doesn't have to you know, challenge your religion necessarily. It's just interesting to see from both sides what people were doing, what they were thinking, how they were processing it. And that give you, should give you plenty of ideas if you're working on a, a book where you have diametrically opposed sides. Just something to think about. Like Man in the High Castle, yeah? That's a good one. Have you ever read this book? No. This is a story by Eric Flint, who, who writes Alternative History. And it is about 
the events of 1812, which we're digging back into things there. The main character in this story is Sam Houston. Mm. And basically, the turning point that starts it from being regular history to alternative history is, I believe in regular history, he was wounded with a uh, arrow and it took a lot to recover from and in this book that did not happen he he was instead missed or the wound was was not quite as serious and he took that one little twist and then said now let's go forward from this event and see how things might have been different right for that character following and for the world because it changed a lot of stuff that happened as like a big domino effect of things. Brett says, how about Ireland from the perspective of the Druids versus St. Patrick? <laughs> what happens if the Druids win? <laughs> then we have more snakes. In England? Or in Ireland, rather? Yeah, well, St. Patrick was the one to drive off the snakes, so if you kill off St. Patrick's because the Druids win, you've got more snakes. This is a no-brainer. Okay, all right. Fair enough. Fair enough. You're going to follow that nonsense. Fair enough. There are so many opportunities. Even such a thing as, as say, how if you find out how Hawaii was kind of colonized. Oh, man, what a big old mess that was. Sandwich Islands in general. Uh, or even South America. You have plenty of opportunities to basically say, wow, wasn't this fucked up? And you have an opportunity to go from either side. You can go from the imperial or the the uh, the colonist, or you can go from the natives. You know, you have three different sides of that. And that would be, that's very fertile ground to do all sorts of good stuff. Wow, somebody has a lot to say. <laughs> oh, another putty has entered the uh, the domicile. Aha. Uh -huh. I wonder when we were going to see him. It's Leo so says, I'm ready for my lob. I was ready to take over the show. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something you chat would think about doing for history and just basically plucking it up and putting it in sci-fi? Or fantasy for that matter. Yeah. Any, any alternative setting. Hit us with your best shot. As long as it's not Edward Penis Hands. Well, why not? Edward Penis Hands. Here we go. In space. In space. No one can hear you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. The entire pacing of this entire show is based on chat and cats. <laughs> fair cop. This is a fair cop. What else are you going to do? I don't know, Terry. When, when, which one would you pluck up and write? Which one really, really excites you? Well, even though um, I think it was Brett said that pirates are very common in space opera, I kind of like the idea of the the chaos of the Caribbean. There's a lot of shit going on down there during that time, and people of questionable morals are easily at hand. I kind of <laughs> like that story a lot, so I would do that. Sir Francis Drake would be another interesting one to go after. The letters of Mark and all that. Chris says, what if Africa became the world power instead of Europe? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that would change shit very much. <laughs> the food would be Ooh, interesting. Yeah, the food would be interesting. Huh. Huh. I had never even thought about how cuisine would be changed. Oh, yeah. Imagine, if you would, that Asian dishes were what was popular here around the world these days. That was, that was the big thing. And it's very popular in a big portion of the world. But it would be, how would our lives change if fast food were of... Um, is, is it the right word to say of, the, of an oriental value? I don't think that's the right word. Well, how, it's not Asiatic. How would you describe it of, of China, Japan, all of those locations there as one group? What are we doing as a, as a whole? Is it Asiatic? Is it oriental? I don't, I don't I'm not know. sure. I don't know. 
But if in any case, in question. any case, in any case, if food from that region was suddenly dumped into American culture, how would fast food be different? Trying to figure that out would be interesting. Noodles, like I think noodles would be big. So like, in other words, instead of Italian or Mexican, well, let's go to Japanese. Japanese would be everything everywhere. There'd be a Japanese bell instead of Taco Bell. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. What about the triangle trade through the Caribbean and West Africa? Yeah. 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 There's all sorts of good stuff. Brett says someone has never been to Jollibee, a Philippine version of McDonald's. No, I have not. No, I have not. I wonder if there's <laughs> yeah, anyone close close by. Did you go to that in Japan, Brett, or have you been to the Philippines? I honestly don't know which that is. They got to look it up while the cats go. It's a delivery Ooh, service. Oh, okay. Oh, you have a Jollibee near you. All right. Medical Center in Katy. Interesting. Well, I never go over to Middle Medical Center in Katy. It looks like there is one inside 610 on uh, Alternate 90. 288. A mere 23 miles from where I live. I don't see any up in your way. No. We don't have ethnic food up here, which is another lie. I had just never heard of Jollibee before. I don't know, man. Chicken Joy fried chicken, chicken tenders, chicken joy meal deals, Jolly Spaghetti and Palabak Fiesta. I'm not sure what Palabak Fiesta, but it sounds interesting. It doesn't seem all that different. There's there's a definite flavor going in there, but I'm not sure that's you know like going for some quick noodles and 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 Indian food, Indian food takeout. That would be interesting. Oh, well, I love Indian takeout. Indian takeout is awesome. Getting Indian takeout all the time. I got get the nuclear vindaloo. Your nose hairs start wilting the moment you get in there and you just smell it. Oh, your eyes start watering, and that's before you even taste it. Yeah. Michael says, I like the way a lit RPG brings the modern world into a fantasy setting. Yeah, it's true. To a degree. Isn't that just the, the virtue of it being a, a, a portal fantasy in general, though? Yes. But Pretty I mean, much. That's not, that, that's not really... A lit RPG thing that's more of a portal fantasy thing. <laughs> Jollof Rice Way Taco Bell's Rice. Hmm. I don't know about that. I don't even know what in place of. Okay. <laughs> in place of. <laughs> because that's what it should obviously have meant. Uh, yeah, because I got that. <laughs> Space opera lit RPG. There are those, aren't there? There have been some of that, but it's not nearly as common. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder about this. That would be kind of odd. Damn, auto correct. <laughs> Auto misspell is what it should be called most of the time anyway. Well, if you have a question about this show or a comment, you can send an email to show at DebroBotSociety.com. You can find me on Mastodon at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley at B-Y-R-S-E dot social. You can find us on Facebook at the Dev Robot Society writing community where we mangle all the madness. You can find us on YouTube at YouTube.com slash DRS podcast where we are live every Saturday, 3 p.m. CST. Like and subscribe so you know when we're live. And if you want to support the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash DRS podcast. You can buy me at coffee.com slash DRS podcast, where for as little as $1 a month, Terry will spank you. Oh, I assure you, it will not be me that's spanking you. And you'll get access to exclusive live shows like the one that's coming up in just over 10 minutes. Where we will be talking about Lit RPG crossed with Edward Penis Hands. And at the $10 level, you get your name right on our $10 patrons are Nate Cosby, Antoine Bass, Tony L. Joy, Rick Shaw, Lisa Slack, Isabel Cushy, and Tim Niederreiter. Thank you to all of our patrons for helping us pay our StreamYard bills. Son of a biscuit.
<laughs> and with that, we should let you get back to your March Madness or whatever it is you're doing. I know all your brackets are broken and you're just drinking beer. So V, wait, wait. hold it together. This tournament will turn around. Just hold it together. That worst penis hands and spanking. Mm. On that note, we are out of here. <laughs> Enjoy the rest Insert of your Saturday. Insert penis hand here. Thank you for hanging out with us. We're sorry for all the mental damage that Terry and I have caused you, but but at some point we're not that sorry. Back. We're not really that sorry. And and V will will join us again when she's not busy watching her progeny bowl. With that, we are out of here. We will see you next week. Have a good one. Bye bye.